John picked me up one day and I had on some bell bottom blue jeans, you know, and purple Converse tennis shoes and a t shirt with a picture of Jesus on the back, whatever he looked like. You know, we don't know what he looks like, but. Yes. And he takes me to this revival he's doing. Hmm. And he says, I want you to share your testimony. And so I, you know, before I got saved, I couldn't give a book report. Yes. I'd have to write it out orally. I was, I didn't want to get in a crowd, I didn't want to speak in public. I didn't raise my hand and ask questions in class. I was too shy, and and uh, but God turned me into a different person. Amen. And I shared my testimony that night, and uh, got in the car, and John said, "You have the gift." And I said, "What do you mean the gift?" He said, "To, to preach." He said, "When you was giving your testimony tonight, he said I was watching the people." And he said, God has gifted you. And I didn't really think much of it. And, but I went that whole year and I began uh, preaching in children's church at First Baptist Church. And I mean, it was, it was like I preached today almost. And some of these kids, they'd be bawling out there, you know, and, and I'm, I'm preaching on hell or heaven. And, yeah. and uh, it probably for the heavy stuff back then, you look at the age of the kids, but we had our 100 year. Uh, anniversary of the church a few years back and a, and a man came up to me and he said my name is so and so and he said I'm a pastor he said I got saved in children's church when you preach one oh, Sunday you know God. and I was just like because I mean That's you true. know but you know I surrendered to preach under Angel Martinez was a Southern Baptist evangelist yes and uh, but then I began to run from preaching I never ran from God I ran from preaching. I thought, oh, man, I'm, you know, I'm not qualified. Uh, let me go home and be an electrician, go on yeah. business with my brother. Sure. sure. Uh, and I ran for about a year, and I was at Texas Tech University my freshman year, and uh, flunking everything, fighting with God mm-hmm. over the ministry. Yeah. And one night on my bed, I said, okay, God, I'll preach. And it was like 300 pounds lifted off of me. And I, yeah. I called my mom and I said, you know, I'm flunking out. Mm-hmm. But I said, it's because I've been running from God. I said, I'm going to be a preacher. And I'm coming home. And I'm going to go to Frank Phillips College, junior college. And basically was going to go to college just to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, witness to people. Yes. And take classes that may help me speak. I took speech classes and Bible classes and... And, uh, but, you know, I, I tell people that come to me today and thinking about wanting to go into the ministry. Yes. And I say, it's basically, if you can find anything else and you can be happy with, do it. Do it. But if you can't do anything else, because my wife and I have, have joked, you know, and I said, God ruined me for anything else. I, I, there's nothing else I could be successful at. Right. You know, I mean, going out and making money or whatever. Yes. And, you know, uh, I don't totally understand because everybody's in full time ministry. Sure. sure. You know, so I don't like to use the term. Os Guinness kind of got me on this uh, full time ministry mm-hmm. because that says to the electrician, the banker, yeah. the lawyer, financial advisor that you're not in full-time ministry. Right, right. When really you are, everybody is. Amen. They're just called in different yes. occupations. Yes. But the preaching, you know, it's something that uh, if you chose it, I think it could be devastating. Yes. Mm-hmm. But it, it's something that, that just, uh, you know, God really puts this calling on your life and uh, it's so big, and not because you know you're a preacher, but you know the the gospel is life and death. Amen. And so, if I give a presentation that's not true, yes, or false salvation, uh, you know, today we've got so many pulpits today that will not even preach that Jesus is the only way. Yes. Yeah. And so. 
man, there are people sitting in our pews that don't even know Jesus. Yes. And, you know, when I went into the ministry, all the preachers that I knew, and I'm sure there was, the internet has blown up everything. We know everything everybody does, every sin everybody commits. But uh, you didn't see it in that day. No. And they were in it for salvation and for God. Yes. And then I think when Christian television came up and, and everybody wanted to be Billy Graham and get the numbers and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then you saw preachers flying on jet planes and, and everybody go, that's what I want. You know, I remember my friend Mario Murillo was speaking at Christ for the Nations. Yes. And uh, one of his friends, the guy had gotten saved in one of his meetings on the limousine service. Mm-hmm. And so he called Mario. He said, now, I'm picking you up and taking you to the, to the meetings. In a limo. In a limo. Yeah, yeah, sure. And Mario says, okay, okay. And so <laughs> the guy picks him up. And, uh, you know, Mario never liked sitting in the back. He'd sit in the front. Even when he was on Christian stations, they'd send a limo to pick him up. He was always sitting by the driver, you know. And no, no, you're going to sit back there. And so he sits in the back and they pull up at Christ for the Nations. And I guess these two kids are talking about what they wanted to do, what they're going to major in, you know. And then the guy gets out and opens the door. Mario steps out and the guy goes, I'm going to be an evangelist. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's, you know, you've got to have a burden for people. You do. You, you do. know, and I think when, you know, I was going to get to this later, but as we're just flowing in yeah. this, it's really sad to me, you know, I've, I've walked with God, you know, since my teenage years as well. And when we look at what the traditional church, the brick and mortar church and whatever names out there, yeah. you know, that i never in my wildest dreams could have imagined that this particular church would be espousing this type of doctrine yeah. and forsaking the truth of the scripture. Yeah. I had a, a neighbor and uh, I was out in my yard doing some work, and and she was a, a an older woman, and mm-hmm. I could tell she just wanted to talk. And so I stopped what I was doing, and I walked over there, just kind of right on the edge of our property lines. Yeah. And she says, "Can I speak to you for a minute?" I said, "Well, you know, you speak to me anytime." You yeah. Know? And. Um, the particular denomination that she was involved in, which she had been a member of probably for 50, 60 years, mm-hmm. were having a very heated discussion um, about what marriage is, mm-hmm. uh, what a man is, what a woman is. And, and she made this remark to me, and she was grieved. You know, she has, this was, this church, she had given her tithes up there all these years mm-hmm. and been a faithful member. Mm-hmm. And she said these words to me. She said, I feel like the church has left me mm-hmm. and I'm not leaving the church. But I almost felt like she was asking me for permission in a way. Yeah. Am I, is it okay, Ken, for me to leave this denomination? Yeah. Like she was wanting my right. blessing. And when I look at that, and what, what are some of your thoughts when you see yeah. that and see some of the preaching and it grieves my heart it, 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 because know. we're Christians, you know, we're not Baptist, Assembly of God, Methodist. Uh, that's kind of the identity of what we believe, you know, right. in a sense. You know, there's assemblies of gods and charismatics. I mean, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the second work of the Holy Spirit after salvation, and. So when you use that term, they kind of know that you believe in the gifts and, right. you know, you know what Southern Baptists pretty much believe and Methodist and, right. and when you grow up in that, because they all spawn from somewhere, you know, right. Presbyterians were really on fire for God at one time and all of them were. Jonathan Edwards and, yeah. and then, you know, the, the splits became a split because this one become man made and dying and then this split off and there was life and sometimes it brought life back to this one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never dreamed that I would see the day that Southern Baptists would be debating whether homosexuality was acceptable. You know, and the whole convention Shocking. is in a divide right now uh, over social issues. Right. 
that the Bible is very clear, clear about. Black and white. And when you're older and, and you've grown up and you love your denomination and you love God and, and you see it changing mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, the euthanasia, uh, the killing of the old. Yes. And I said to a pastor one time, I said, we're euthanizing the church. And wow. he said, what do you mean euthanizing the church? I said, everything is geared toward youth. We're killing the old. Yes. We're saying we want your tithes because you're faithful tithers. They've got the money. But then shut up. Yeah. We don't want any of your opinions. Mm -hmm. We we, we're hip now. We're trying to reach this, and so they compromise the gospel to get their pews filled. But people are not saved. And my goodness, the Lord talked about their blood is on our hands. Yeah, watchmen on the wall. And for me to love a homosexual is to tell the homosexual the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Bible talks about speaking the truth in love. Yes. You, you don't have to beat them over the head no. with the Bible. You can share in love. That's right. And that's how I think you win them over. That's right. With the love and the truth. I don't shun anybody. No, no. But I tell them the truth in love because you've got to make a decision. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I led a guy to the Lord in college, and he went back to his... Uh, uh, fraternity, and he said, "Man, he said I'm I'm saved, you know." And he was on fire for God, and a bunch of his fraternity brothers said, "Man, we are too." Weird. He said, "No, you're not." And they said, "Yes, we are. We're Christians." He said, "No, you're not." And he said, "Yes, we are." And he said, "Well, I'm not going to be the type of Christian you are." He said, "You calling me your brother, and you knew I was dying and going to hell, and you never told me about Jesus." Ooh. I mean, he hadn't been yeah. saved twenty four hours. Yes, that's a state. And it's an indictment on us. Yes, and so to lie yeah. to a transgender, a homosexual, uh, a fornicator, yeah. an adulterer, everything's yeah. going to be fine. God loves you just the way you are. Right. Uh, no, when you come to Christ, it's repentance, and you're changed. Mm-hmm. And repentance is not saying, I'm sorry. Right. It's turning around yes. and going another direction. Amen. And we think it's, I'm sorry, God, you know, forgive me. And you know, that's an apology. But that's, you know, the sin, it, there are natural temptations. And then there's unnatural. And the Bible talks yes. about the unnatural in Romans chapter one. Yes. And so, you know, we're born. That's why we need to be born again, have a new nature. Amen. And we still battle. Yes. Uh, we don't live in sin anymore. Yes. We're not a slave of sin. We battle sin. We will sin. But it's very difficult for a Christian to live in sin. Mm-hmm. I mean, the hound dog from heaven. Yes. I think it's Billy Sunday it's called the Holy Spirit. You, you, you're, you're miserable. You are. Absolutely, the most miserable person in the world is someone who has met Christ living the life of a sinner. And yeah. I think it was uh, Nietzsche said that uh, what disgusted him was people, atheists, that don't believe in God, mm-hmm. but they lived their life like a Christian. Yeah. They had morals. They did. And That's I read that and I said, you know what kind of angers me is someone who professes to be a Christian and lives like an atheist. Yes. Oh, that hurts. You know, and uh, my college pastor, Barry Woods, had had a quote. He quoted all the time. I'm my neighbor's Bible. He reads me when we meet. Today it's in my home, tomorrow in the street. Love it. And we may be the only Bible. These people read. I remember Tanya and I were, I think, up in North Carolina, and we were eating after a service, and... uh, this restaurant, Tanya had a real nice dress on, you know, and the, the waitress came and she dropped a whole plate of food mm. on Tanya. Yeah. And she was waiting to be really chewed out or whatever. And, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Tanya said, it's okay, it's okay. Yes. And she said, are you okay? Mm. And the lady said, oh, I'll, I'll pay for your dress to be dry clean. Tanya said, no, you're not. Don't worry about it. It happens. Yes. And the pastor said, that is the greatest testimony, a witness for Jesus that I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's sitting there waiting for her to get her head taken off. Yeah. 
somebody get all bent out yeah. of shape, and yet she's showing the love of Christ yeah. because yeah. Christ is living yeah. in Tanya, and the yeah. Spirit of God is working through her. Yeah.